Welcome to Eye Contact. I'm Sean Hennehan. We're talking with Dr. Keith Barton about subconjunctival devices for glaucoma. Welcome, Dr. Barton. Thank you very much, Sean. We've had glaucoma drainage devices available for many decades and now have many new devices available. What are the clinical trials and, and real-world experience telling us about the safety and efficacy of subconjunctival devices? Well, the subconjunctival devices are, or MIGs, and some debate whether these are MIGs or not, but we, we, call, them, we call them MIGs because, they're, because in general they are uh, minimally invasive, uh, perhaps not as minimally invasive as an eye stent, but, but reasonably minimally invasive and, uh, and uh, uh, quite efficacious in, in, in uh, selected cases. Uh, the devices w that fall into this category are the Zen and the, the in-focus microshunt. Now, why would someone decide to use one of those rather than maybe one of the easier to replace part, uh, stents? It's it's largely a, an efficacy uh, uh, thing. The the, um, the trabecular meshwork stents, uh, the Schlems canal surgery is is generally good for getting patients, for instance, patients having phaco uh, on lower meds. Mm. But uh, if you need a 30, 40 percent pressure drop, you're less likely to achieve that with a a, a canal surgery alone, whereas uh, in selected cases, the, the Zen and the in-focus microshunt can produce huge drops in pressure. So where does that leave us uh, since the famous tubes versus TRAB study? Well, it's, they're very different. Obviously, the tube versus TRAB, the TVT study was um, in quite significant glaucoma. The patients mm. had mean visual field deviation of about 16. So they, these were largely advanced glaucoma. They had previous trabeculectomy failure or previous cataract surgery. And 88%, as I recall, of the cataract surgery in the TVT study was actually scleral tunnel or, or extra cap. It wasn't a clear, only 12% were clear corneal phaco. So it's a very different patient group that you'd be putting the MIGs in from the, the TVT study. Now, uh, you were saying earlier that, that they might be more of a challenge for cataract surgeons to place the subconjunctival devices. What do they need to know? What, what, what well, it, the, encouragement can you give them? Obviously, for a cataract surgeon uh, to do an eye stent, uh, you, you need to learn gonioscopy hmm. and how to put them in. And that's pretty much it. You can't really get it, get it wrong. It doesn't interfere with your workflow. They either work or they don't. Uh, there's a, while there's a greater potential efficacy from the subconjunctival MIGs, the techniques are, require mitomycin C application. Uh, the uh, in-focus microshunt requires conjunctival surgery. The Zen requires blood management as well. Th these not only uh, affect the surgery itself, um, some may be com comfortable doing conjunctival surgery or mitomycin if there was no post-operative uh, bleb management required. But for, the, for a high volume cataract surgeon, and, and it's easy to generalize, this obviously does not apply to all cataract surgeons, but for a high volume cataract surgeon, bleb management might not fit into the workflow of their practice at all. Uh, manipulating uh, needling or, or even revising blebs if they, if they don't work. So while some uh, cataract surgeons who are who have traditionally done trabeculectomies might be very comfortable doing these. Others who, are, uh, who, who have a very s slick, high volume refractive practice that doesn't involve uh, long-term post-operative management, th this may completely upset their workflow and it may not be what the sort of thing they want to do. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and it makes you wonder then, <clears throat> when is the right time to refer? Uh, and uh, what if the cataract surgeon thinks, oh, this looks like a trab, or we need to go in? And, and when, when would he make that decision to refer to a glaucoma surgeon? Again, it's easy to generalize, but to, and I found in London that the refractive surgeons are actually very early to, at referring because mm. they, don't want to, um, they don't want to have, they don't want to manage long-term glaucoma mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they, 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 they're uh, largely refractive practices. Uh, so if it, anything requires follow-up, and they there's a lot of follow-up. Yeah, a lot that. of follow-up. Yeah. They, they don't want to miss a patient developing glaucoma afterwards, so they, they often refer early, in my experience. But uh, again, that will depend on the type of practice. If, if you're a very specialized cataract refractive surgical practice, you probably won't want anything to do with glaucoma. If you're a more comprehensive practice, you might be very happy managing glaucoma and, and uh, refer later. 
and you've been practicing for many years, what, have, what are you thinking about um, FACO as part of IOP control or, or reduction? Uh, FACO obviously lowers IOP, and you know, some of my refractive colleagues will, will say, oh, don't worry, the FACO will help control FACO your glaucoma. FACO will take care of it. Hmm. Yeah. Obviously it doesn't, it doesn't. The, the ocular hypertension treatment study is a very good reference uh, study because that shows that roughly 50% of patients will get a 20% pressure drop, roughly. Um, the average across the study was about 16.5% pressure drop. So it's not a big pressure drop. It's about half the effect of latanoprost in the original uh, latanoprost trials. So you're talking about um, a modest pressure lowering, which is obviously a benefit, but it's not glaucoma curing. If you've got mild ocular hypertension, that's great. If you've got angle closure, you can get a massive pressure drop. Mm. But if you've got uh, visual field loss and you're worried about progression, this is not enough. So it helps, but it's not it the helps. cure. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's certainly not unwelcome. <laughs> well, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And thank you for joining us. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at eurotimes.org.